Probando, probando. Un, dos, tres. Saludos, gente bella. Es un, dos, tres. Salutación. Bonjour, belle persona. Testing. One, two, one, two, three. Greetings, beautiful people. Este evento es multilingüe y con interpretación en español, francés e inglés. Este evento es multilingüe con interpretación en español, francés e inglés. This event is multilingual and with interpretation in Spanish, French, and English. We collaborate as interpreters in Cooperativa Brújulas doing language and healing justice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of Caribbean Women for Climate Justice Conference. I am Durval Bazi, host of the Climate Conscious Podcast and co-lead for CW4CG. So I'll be your host for this evening's program alongside Ms. Ayana Alain. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayana. I'm a member of the Breadfruit Collective and also a member of the Caribbean Women for Climate Justice planning team. And I'm so excited to have everyone here. Yes. So we've been having very rich conversations over the past two days as we focus on solutions for gender and climate justice in the Caribbean. So day one featured panel one, which discussed um, different boats, same sea, gender and climate advocacy in the Caribbean. And we had a very interesting discussion with contributions from a, a very diverse panel, including um, Indigenous voices uh, and activists. And something that stood out to me, something that Malini Allen, um, a human rights lawyer, and she said that I don't see myself as a lawyer. Instead, I use the tool, I use the law as a tool to seek justice. And that had me thinking that we each have a mandate to seek justice, whether you are a lawyer, an educator, an artist, a policymaker. We all have various tools and skills that we can use to contribute to building a more just and equitable society. So Ayana, what stood out to you on day two? Well, I think that we can all agree, those of us that were here yesterday, that Ms. Caitlin Carew had an electrifying keynote. She spoke about the importance of highlighting rural women, rural communities, when we're thinking about, you know, development and climate justice in the Caribbean as a whole. And she also brought up a really interesting concept about how in the Caribbean we're kind of stuck in a paradise paradox. And I'd never heard that term before, but it's just where we're painted as a tourist just destination, very exotic, and that can kind of um, eclipse a lot of the issues that we're facing with climate justice and climate injustice, I should say. So that was very interesting. And we also had a great panel um, about gender sensitive leadership. All of the panelists had such insightful things to say and it was really interesting to hear about all of their perspectives and I really had an enjoyable time. Indeed and also I remember Lydia saying that you know no one can really empower you but you have to empower yourself. So I'm really hoping that by participating in CW4CJ that we all feel empowered to become involved or more involved in the work of advancing gender and climate justice in the region. So today, uh, we have panel three, inclusive by design, creating resilience and equitable communities. And we're exploring the challenges and opportunities within our built environment and how to implement urban planning and rural development with a gendered lens. It's all about using a gendered lens. But before we get into the main discussion for today, we do have a little entertainment, a little um, creative outlet. You know, we always try to keep creativity as part of the CW for CJ agenda. So this evening, we have none other than Miss Dana Lynn Swaby, host of the Global Yadi podcast and also a member of the CW for CJ planning committee. So with no further ado, I would like to invite Miss Dana Lynn Swaby to share with us her creative piece, Dana Lynn. Thank you, Derval and Ayana, and welcome everyone to day three. Now, this poem was written uh, originally on International Women's Day for a group of rural women from my community, and it was just a privilege for the words to emerge from the heart. Here goes, Ode to the Rural Woman. 
to live without woman? Tell me where you would have do man. From me little and I grow, me see and me know. Rural women are reservoirs of culture. The cement, the steel, the foundation of any family structure. The dressmaker, the shoemaker, the doctor, the overnight medicine concoctor, the banker and the builder. A million roles rural women are built for. Yet still, recognizing women's rights feels like fights on top of fights. The most painful abscess unequal access, unequal access to education, a plaguing consideration, unequal access to health, an obstacle to building wealth, unequal access to property holds us down in poverty, unequal access to money, queen bee, dirt period, no honey. Rural women are made for more. We are towers of strength, building bridges for better opportunities. We have gone great lengths. Speaking loud and proud on education to better the nation. Shattering glass ceilings for leadership, community development, and business. Championing agriculture, gender equality, and climate change. Rural women, women have range. On every social issue, we have come to change the game so the right to a better future the next generation can claim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana Lynn. And now I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator for our third panel, Inclusive by Design, Creating Resilient and Equitable Communities. And that would be Kendria Ferguson, a native of the Bahamas. Kendria has a bachelor's in marine biology and also a master's degree in global sustainability, sustainable energy. Kendria's experience included marine mammal research, sustainable development with the tourism sector, climate change and its intersection with social sciences, and also developing a national campaign to ban select single-use plastics and strategies for increasing renewable energy integration across the public sector and residential landscape. Kendria is currently pursuing her PhD studies with the University of the West Indies, Mona Sustainable Development Institute. Kendria is exploring the socioeconomics of natural disasters within the Bahamian context. Over to you, Kendria. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, that poem was such a great segue into tonight's session. Um, I am honored to be here tonight to guide our panelists. And I definitely want to thank everybody that joined us tonight. Uh, it's definitely going to be a dynamic conversation. So please drop your comments in the chat and we'll have a question and answer session towards the end. Um, so tonight, our panel focus on inclusive by design, creating resilient and equitable communities. I will be helping our panelists direct the conversation as we explore both the built environment and its challenges, as we understand how we can implement urban planning and design that through a gendered lens and identify solutions for reducing risk faced by women in climate vulnerable locations. Lastly, we will also look at the design best practices we all should advocate for and implement that can improve our spaces for even those with disabilities. So I would now invite our panelists to introduce themselves. We have Ms. Dorian Duncan, Ms. Shan Coffey Young, Ms. Mariah Hamilton, Mr. Gabriel Jux, and Dr. Vanessa Dean. Dorian, we'll start with you. Thank you for that, Kendrew. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dorian Duncan. I am from Kingston, Jamaica. Um, I'm a trained urban planner, um, and I'm the founder of Island City Lab. Island City Lab is a relatively new urban planning and urban design research think tank that is dedicated to co-developing and finding best solutions for how we physically develop our urban spaces. Thank you. We'll go ahead, Shai. Well, hello everyone and good evening. I am Shan Coffey Young, the founder and CEO of a social enterprise in Trinidad and Tobago called Sile Environmental. And we do waste management, education, and training. So our mission is to transform the way 
we think and act towards waste. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Shan. Mariah, go ahead. Uh, good night, everyone. My name is Mariah Hamilton. I am a civil engineering junior at Howard um, with a focus in sustainable infrastructure. And I'm also the founder of Green TGY, which is a platform on Instagram that seeks to educate people on green engineering, climate advocacy, and sustainable development. It's nice to meet all of you. Great. Welcome. And Gabriel? Uh, hi, good day, everyone. First of all, let me apologize for uh, my lack of a video. Um, I've been having this problem for a week. Um, hi, my name is um, Gabriel Jokes. I am um, a disability advocate. I am also a person with a disability. I'm Guyanese, and I am one of the founders of an up-and-coming NGO called um, Guyanese Association for Persons with Physical Disabilities. We um, are focused on the with physical disabilities, particularly those with mobility issues like cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, and amputees and such. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ben Dr. Vanessa Dean? Thank you, Kendria. It's such a pleasure to be here with this panel. Um, as you've heard, I'm Dr. Vanessa Dean. I'm the director of the Graduate Urban Planning Program at New York University. By ethnicity and descent, I'm Haitian American. I spent 10 years after the 2010 earthquake working on the ground in Haiti. Everything from what I'd like to call hands in the dirt work through advising the Haitian government's Ministry of uh, Planning and External Cooperation. In my current capacity and research agenda, I'm looking at uh, systemic issues pertaining to the French Caribbean and their ability to sort of engage in um, improved climate adaptation planning vis-a-vis -vis their post-colonial relationship with France. And most recently, I was a visiting professor of urban planning at Sorbonne University in Paris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. So let's dive into it. Uh, our first question for tonight, how does the lack of gender expertise in urban planning and city design perpetuate gender inequalities? Doreen, you want to start that one? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think most people think about urban infrastructure or urban systems. So things like water supply or garbage collection or transportation as impartial or objective things that are, you know, developed by unbiased, technically competent folks, right? But within the ways that these systems work or don't work for people, we are actually stating very explicitly or kind of preferences and priorities for certain people or certain communities of other communities, right? So I'll give you a specific example. Island City Life, we've been kind of exploring transportation for the past couple of months, right? And one of the things that we found is that the ways that men and women get around their cities are actually very different, right? So women in our societies, this is globally, um, are primarily responsible for caregiving. So not just our children, but think of elderly parents, um, family members and those who are ill, those who, are, who have disabilities, right? So the needs that they have of a transportation system are actually very different than men who don't have those responsibilities. So I'll give you two kind of findings that they've, they've kind of researched, right? So caregivers um, are taking a lot more trips, but they're taking shorter trips from home. So you can imagine a mother taking her kids, dropping one off at daycare, one off at school, doing grocery shopping and coming back. So she's doing a lot of trips, but they're really short. In addition to that, caregivers also rarely travel alone and they're you know, traveling oftentimes with groups. So you may travel with your kids, your nieces, your nephews, and maybe you're also traveling with grandma. And in the midst of all of this travel, you are carrying school, school books, you're carrying backpacks, you're carrying groceries, right? Um, so all of that, mean, what that means is that they're spending a lot of more money to get around than men. Um, and they require more spaces, not just in buses, but also more rest stops in their communities between destinations. So to your question, Kendria, um, because we don't factor in gender considerations into our transportation system, most of our cities have kind of invested in car-centric transportation systems that are not optimal for caregivers, right? And the vast majority of which 
are lower income and cannot afford the luxuries and the convenience of a private car, right? So this creates sort of burdens for caregivers economically and it makes their duties more expensive, more difficult, and sometimes even more unsafe. Uh, thank you so much. That's such a great point to really consider the in-depth look at, at a woman's world first, uh, in the informal side as well as from the social aspect. Um, Vanessa, do you want to jump on this one as well? Yeah, I'd love that. And Doreen did a good job of sort of laying out the physical barriers and how we think about, you know, space and urban planning decisions. I'd like to also focus on the political economy considerations of what we mean when we talk about planning um, and design. And that goes to speak to sort of the multiple dimensions, right? There are socioeconomic dimensions. There are, um, you know, the physical tangible dimensions that we've just heard of. There are political dimensions in terms of engagement or lack thereof. And ultimately, without including enough perspective, varied perspective, such as women, those with disabilities, even children and youth and others, what we oftentimes end up with are outcomes that are not as robust as they could be. Um, for example, uh, when we think of local knowledge, right, if women are not as represented in decision-making seats, there are things that we could benefit from knowing that we're not able to capitalize on um, in a way that would be helpful if those perspectives were sort of given a seat at the table or if that type of knowledge was valued. Um, when you think about things like um, where things get located, you know, one example that comes to mind is um, a marketplace in a rural African community. I don't remember the country, but, uh, you know, we hear stories of women having to travel women and children for, you know, miles and miles at a time to, you know, get to work, get to the markets, you know, access clean water, things of that nature. So you have an outside development entity that just comes and situates a marketplace closer to where these women uh, live. So you would think, oh, this is great. You know, they have a shorter trip. We've solved this issue. In this example, women still weren't going to that marketplace or choosing to opt to continue going that longer distance. So what someone on the outside would look at and see as, you know, not being as effective or, you know, as, as developed as this newer place. And why? It's because in that community, there are so few gathering spaces or time to connect with your neighbor and others. And so that walk is something that was of value to them. Um, and, you know, to not have that by having the shorter trip sort of took away this undercurrent, this social dynamic that you wouldn't be aware of if you're not tapping into the knowledge that exists locally. So all of this to say, had women been involved in the conversation, hey, you need a new marketplace, where might we cite it? exploring other options uh, for the siting could have been a, a lot more effective and a better use of resources. So that's one. Another thing that I'll say briefly from the political economy, uh, political economy perspective is disasters, right? If we look at climate change as a disaster, which it is, um, disasters tend to not necessarily create the problems that we're responding to, but they tend to exacerbate already existing issues that have that are sort of already at play in a system. Society. So they're not necessarily equalizers. Yes, everyone can be affected, women, men, you know, uh, rich, poor. However, those who are more vulnerable pre-disaster are going to be even more vulnerable post-disaster and the like. And so taking into consideration what the needs are, doing needs assessments and things of that nature to highlight what communities have more people with disabilities versus others and women and children, you know, those types of considerations um, at the front end would lead us to better outcomes, ideally at the tail end, if more women, if more voices were incorporated throughout our processes. Oh, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, the idea of not only looking at the physical and socioeconomic um, elements or dimensions of these public systems, but also inclusivity in conversation and planning, um, having women at the table to give that valuable feedback is very important. Uh, let's move to our second question, uh, which is really focused on identifying examples of resilient development practices that can be incorporated in rural development and urban and city planning. And we can start question two with, uh, let's start with Mariah and then we'll go with Vanessa afterwards to jump in. Yeah, um, this question really had me because um, it's when it comes to resilient communities, I think what's left on the back burner a lot is need and access and the part that equity plays in between now because you can, provide, you can take care of the need 
and you can make it accessible. But if it isn't accessible to everybody, um, it's difficult. Um, and so for resilient communities, I think that there needs to be a strong focus on agriculture, transportation, and infrastructure. Um, agriculture that is resilient um, and sustainable, and that is very accessible to the community. Um, transportation that is also sustainable, that is low carbon, um, that is localized, that is decarbonized, um, and infrastructure that is also very resilient to disasters and everything else that comes along with having infrastructure that actually serves a purpose to protect frontline communities. Um, and so just infrastructure like permeable pavements, um, green roof, green walls, um, materials that are not that are not harmful to the environment and that don't, don't harm frontline communities, um, I think is also very important. So yeah. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, community engagement um, and ensuring that the solutions that you provide, even though you think that they work well, um, they are accepted by the community and they have some sort of input um, in that decision. So yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Vanessa. Yeah, I, you know, again, I'm excited for this panel because I feel like we're able to sort of build off of each other and how we think about these questions um, to a lot of what Mariah just shared and thinking about um, resilient infrastructure and a design, um, a development example is one that I really like to talk about. It's a rural community that I was working in in Haiti. And to give an example, to get to this community, you would drive, it's a uh, Petit Guave, you would drive two hours from the capital uh, of Haiti to Petit Guave. And then you would drive in about 40 minutes up a mountain to a point that the vehicle can't go anymore. And then you would walk the next hour to this community. And I, I give that background to say, you know, people are thinking of like development and aid relief or whatever, you know, popping down in the capital, taking one or two pictures that you did this great work in leaving is not necessarily reaching the like deep inner corners of a place that needs assistance, right? So this particular community had a school shelter that they had built, very you know minimal resources from what we would you know think of. But what I loved about it is that this one school shelter doubled as a school for the children by day, a school for the adults at night. There were times of day that it was the church for the prayer services and on Sundays, it was also the health clinic um, and, you know, the gathering place when it wasn't being used for like as a community center, the kids would play, the woman would chat on their way to and fro. And so this one structure um, was able to have all these dynamic purposes that cuts down on the built environment um, in a, you know, disaster prone climate, you know, stricken area, climate stricken area, um, but was also able to serve all of these purposes in a way that fostered community development and engagement um, and was central. And so thinking about minimizing our imprint, but still maximizing impact, you know, I feel like this uh, example does that quite well. And then going back to systems and design, thinking of how, as part of the community engagement, how do you engage people in ways that are a bit more sort of lasting or uh, resilient so or even even creative in the sense that like visual storytelling is something that I like to think about having community members take you to different places in the community and tell the stories that are, you know, wrapped around these places. And some of these rural areas, you don't have street signs. You don't have the things that we would rely on. This community, honestly, is even so remote that you can't even find them necessarily on Google Maps. We had to sort of make the maps ourselves, take geolocated points and put them on a map to even know where you are, but they know where they are. And so giving a community member, a child, a camera, go take a picture of, you know, where people meet or go take a picture of, you know, water source that used to be there, but isn't there anymore. And things like that and being able to tell a picture through their eyes allows you to gather data, allows you to tell a story and then use that as a basis from which to make future design decisions. So those are some ways um, practically and through the process that you can have sort of more resilient approaches to community building and development. 
Well, thank you for that. Um, to your point about uh, this one building serving multiple uh, roles within a community, I know we definitely see that in the Bahamas where you have a school that is the hurricane shelter. It is the um, kids hang out on a Saturday uh, when they want to play. It is also the area where people have their little community events. And I think that is pretty echoes throughout the region where we have these very uh, prominent buildings that serve a purpose, but also contribute to cultural resilience. Those type of structure is, is a safe place for a lot of people. It's a gathering place. It's where they share information and, and share knowledge. Um, and so that's a very interesting take on how resilient development and infrastructure also impacts uh, resilient community structures and networks. Uh, Mariah, you brought a great point about those strategic materials that can be used for resilient development. Um, do you have any insight in terms of what can be used at a household level for somebody that wants to really just help their own household be resilient and contribute to that overall urban planning? or rural development? Yes, um, I would say more for rural development. Again, where I'm from, the house that I grew up in was built out of Greenheart. And that Greenheart was from the forest that we have because um, we have a lot of Amazon forests. And so I would say just localizing those sources um, is would be a great example to have something that is resilient, but that is also very local. So you don't always need concrete, but you could also use wood that is very near um, and strong. Thank you. Any other of the panelists want to jump on that one? So we'll continue the conversation with question three, which states, uh, what are some of the approaches Caribbean countries can consider or incorporate? to create more inclusive spaces for women, children, and people with disabilities. And this one, we'll start with Gabrielle. Hi. So um, before we speak on um, some of the initiatives um, we would have to um, implement, I think it's important for us to ask, um, for, first of all, understand why you have to implement these ideas. Because I feel like a lot of non-disabled persons and persons with disabilities feel as though um, wanting these more inclusive society is akin to doing us a favor, which then, you know, that is not, that, that is not it. Um, it is a, um, a human right. Um, when you hear statistics that say over 1 million persons in the Caribbean identify as a person with a disability, yet only 10% are employed, um, that's an issue right there, right? So we have to think, okay, so what is the cause? And for me personally, um, as a person living in Guyana, I feel the main issue is due to our infrastructure, right? The infrastructure isn't built with persons with disabilities in mind. And, you know, what exactly is infrastructure? Um, there's a definition um, that I like that says infrastructure is the fundamental systems serving a country. And I like it because it uses that word serve, which means so facilitate the needs of the people. So if your infrastructure isn't doing that and it feels like it's actively harming a section of your population and it's preventing them from progressing, it doesn't matter how fancy everything looks or how everything looks nice, your infrastructure is a failure. So, um, so how do we go about really um, alleviating that issue? I think first and foremost, we need to um, include persons with disabilities in the decision-making that affects their lives. So there's a wonderful phrase that was coined by um, South Africans in the 1990s that says, nothing about us without us, which means you have to include us uh, within this decision-making, right? So that, that's definitely an important part. And one of the ways that you can do that is by helping us to, to get representation. So for example, I think one of the ways that we can get representation is through um, the political arena. Um, because I feel like it's important to have a different point of view, right? So politicians can understand, okay, um, there's an issue here, right? right? I, have, I, have a con I have a comrade here, right? Within, within our spaces that can tell me, hey, do you know, um, as a, um, a political candidate, right? Uh, uh, you know, as a person in the ministry, 
um, I'm visually impaired and persons like myself are being affected, right? But sadly, in Guyana, we don't have those things. We don't have a Kerry and Eiffel or a Floyd Morris, right? So we have, you know, local government elections, which in theory is a bit more inclusive to persons with disabilities because anybody can go there and, you know, run as a candidate. But in practice, that isn't the case because in Guyana, there's a law that prevents persons that access or benefit from public assistance from running in local government elections. And who do you think mostly benefits from public assistance? Persons with disabilities. So we don't have any representation in both um, local and um, the general government. So what are some things we can look at in terms of getting representation? We can look at voting, but the issue is, is that voting is also is largely inaccessible to persons with disabilities because of the infrastructure. For example, a person like myself with mobility issues, I can't go to a polling station, right? Let's say a person that is um, visually impaired, um, there aren't things put in place so that person can vote hassle-free, right? There are no tactile ballots, right? For someone that, that, that um, is hearing impaired, um, there are no persons there to assist them, right? No, no sign language interpretation, right? So we left stuff. No, there are alternatives like proxy voting, but I think I speak for the majority of persons with disabilities when I say that we value our independence and we would like to practice our democratic right in the most, you know, um, direct way possible, which is, you know, voting. So um, I was at Costa Rica the other day and during my time in Costa Rica, compared to Guyana, it was a refreshing experience. It was very accessible, right? There were ramps for persons like myself, right? wheelchair, um, wheelchair bathrooms were very accessible, right? I saw, um, I saw um, elevators, right? And I thought to myself, how were they able to make, you know, these wide region changes? And I, I became curious and, I, and I, bit, I did a bit of research. And in Costa Rica, I heard that a lot of disability advocates were able to get something called a presidential advisor on disability, where there was a, a person with a disability who basically sat down with the president, right, who was part of the government and said, these are some issues that the persons with disabilities within Costa Rica are facing. And these are some of the um, things that you can do to help alleviate those issues. And eventually, he was able to get other persons with disabilities on various um, boards of the government, right? Or rather um, agencies of the government, right? Which ended up um, leading to a pass um, a, magic, um, a massive legislation where um, we see the changes that we see today. So um, I think another thing we can also do to sensitize the general, general public on the rights of persons with disabilities, right? And I'm starting to feel that the reason we're not having a lot of progress in terms of um, creating more um, accessible um, area, uh, more accessible environments of persons with disabilities is that um, persons are sensitized um, about, about, you know, what's going on with us. So let me give you an example. Um, I know a friend that has a, um, that's a wheelchair user. And she had a discussion with one of the ministers of our government. And she sat him down and she said, um, these are some of the issues that persons with disabilities in Guyana are facing, and these are some of the solutions. And at the end of the conversation, he, he, he sat up and he said, I'm surprised you can speak so well, right? That's, that's how we saw her, right? So these are the kind of persons that we're depending on to make those changes, right? That's how they see us. So we've got to try to figure out ways where we can, you know, remove that stigmatization. And I feel the best way to do that is to um, create um, sensitization programs. And I feel the government should work with disability rights advocates and other civil society organizations in order to do that. So maybe let's say in terms of education, in terms of sectors of employment and such, for example, let's look at the kids. I think you should be able to teach kids at an early age about, you know, let's say the different types of disabilities 
um, the specific needs of those persons and the ways that they can help, right? So in theory, when those kids grow up, they grow up with a sense of empathy and understanding for persons with disabilities, right? We could also maybe to teachers the importance of inclusive education, right? Let's include right, persons that are visually impaired, right? Let's include persons who are hard of hearing and things like that. We could also include, you know, the traditional media and social media. We can use those as tools for sensitization as well, right? Just highlight the, the accomplishments of persons with disabilities in the country and around the world, right? So all of these things can help. I feel once, you know, government has the backing of the people, they can do things like create infrastructure that is accessible and inclusive. So, for example, you know, you know, you have to create roads that can accommodate a variety of disabilities, you know, like roads that have sidewalks and curb ramps, right, and that are properly paved, roads that have tactile pavement for persons that are visually impaired, right, all of those things, right, the wheelchair accessible buses, um, accessible buildings that have alternative entrances, right, in the buildings they may have staff that, that are trained to assist persons that are, that are vision and hearing impaired, right? And even when it comes to documents, right? Um, yes, there's, there's an important document there, but what about persons that are visually impaired? Is there an alternative, right? Can you send a soft copy, right? Where a, person's, uh, a person that is visually impaired, their screen reader can maybe um, translate what is on the screen for them. Those are all the things that, um, you have to consider. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Doreen, I saw your hand is up. Yeah, I, I thought that was like an incredible uh, explanation of the situation that's happening. And I, and I just wanted to say that Jamaica, um, or Disabilities Act only recently passed, I believe, this year, right? So in that document, it talked about kind of um, banning employment discrimination. But unfortunately, it had nothing around rights of access in the built environment. So to Gabriel's point around the purpose of infrastructure, being able to serve people, that's completely missing in that document, right? And, and to add extra context, the last census that came out in Jamaica, I think it said about 20% of the population has some form of disability, right? So that's 20% of the population has a disability, but also only 20% of the population owns or drives a car. And we can think about the differences in the way that we allocate infrastructure. So those two different populations are the same amount, right? And how unfair it is, right? That we have created cities for roads, widening roads for people who can afford um, a car, a SUV, whatever it is. That's only 20% of the population. But we have thought so little about the rest of the population that has disabilities and the type of infrastructure that would actually serve them, right? And I just want to kind of conclude by, by saying that I think as a, as a city planner, the process of designing a city needs to be a collaborative act, right? And unfortunately, in most of our cities, the way that our kind of development process happens, regular people, regular communities are excluded from the decision making around these policies and where infrastructure goes, if it happens at all, right? So I think to Gabriel's point around what has been able to happen in Costa Rica to kind of have um, a voice is that I, I think that communities need to be given um, but more realistically, they need to claim more responsibility for planning and designing of their physical spaces, right? And that can look like lots of different things, right? That can look like communities designing community plans and advocating to local governments saying that this is what we want from our community. This is what we want it to look like. These are the features. These are the type of accessible mobility and transportation things. These are the green infrastructure that Mariah had said that we want in these spaces, um, it can look like a lot of different things, right? But I do think to Gabriel's point, we really need to be looking at other places that have forced kind of community advocacy and community involvement in the process of city building and see what the successes were there and employ them in our islands and in our cities. Thank you so much. Shan, you want to chime in as well? You know, I just wanted to echo what Doreen just said um, in terms of you know, ensuring that all of the needs are met, you know, without 
having the space or place in a way that remains efficient. So in terms of, we, Gabriel talked about people with disabilities, um, Doreen talked, we talked about children as well too, and they're being able to access things. But of course, my, because of my training, so I, my first interaction with waste, um, I was trained on an urban planner and it was his responsibility to set up waste systems in the city of Port of Spain. And so that really opened my eyes to the, real, the needs of all, all parties, all people, the disabled, the, because when we talk about access to bins, access to, um, you know, then we, also took, then we also looked at where landfills are placed. Um, because we have the NIMBY syndrome, which is not in my backyard. So nobody wants a landfill behind their house. Nobody wants to know that it is in close proximity to where they are. And so as we talk about infrastructure, we talk about having facilities in place. We talk about being able to address the needs of all. We also have to remember that, you know, in terms of climate resilience, you know, not kind of jumping the gun country up. Um, it is important that waste is, is often considered because that's when I get on my soapbox and I yell, what about waste? What about waste? That's when I, that's when that happens. So, and to Mariah's point, because after you asked it, I was like, no, but then I was like, yeah, I have something to add. There's a lot of work that has been happening with, um, in terms of material use from waste materials. So the biggest one right now is plastic lumber plastic bricks, plastic tiles, and their use for uh, in, in building uh, construction um, and in terms of being resilient to the effects of climate change and any of the other issues that we tend to face. So there's a lot of work happening there. And then she, she talked about local, right? So if we have plastics in large quantities, I don't see why we can't turn that into lumber right in our respective countries and use that to build homes, use that and to build lower cost homes so that people are able to access housing. So that's just one of the, the other things that I just wanted to add to the conversation that we're having. But, you know, it is really important that, as Gabriel said, it's nothing, um, not without, nothing for us without us. Yeah, we have to be a part of that conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I am um, very much so in tune with what Gabriel said and the experiences he mentioned. And it makes me think, has the, has the personal perception of, of persons with disabilities changed over the years? Uh, me growing up, I always... I took note that you rarely saw people or children with disabilities out in public. Um, and to Gabriel's point where you're not getting that level of representation at the decision-making table or even just at the table when it comes to ensuring that government processes are inclusive. Um, are we as, as families uh, accepting of the persons in our family that has disabilities enough to put them out in the public so that they may you know, be able to have interactions uh, amongst themselves, amongst the entire community, but also so then the community can begin to really kind of break some of those stigma that is associated with it. Um, Gabriel, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, can you repeat yourself, if you don't mind? No, I just wanted to get your insights in terms of persons' actual perceptions of people with disabilities, especially the families that may have a person inside their family with a disability. Um, do you see that changing to help kind of break that stigma narrative? Um, um, what can I say? Okay, so I don't even know if I should talk about this, but I remember um, there was a time when the government had a uh, 200,000 allowance for um, persons with disabilities right, around a certain age group, right? And I am now getting um, involved in terms of the disability community and advocacy and such. So there's a couple of I, all, I, that I know about all the time, right? It's like, like let's say 30 of us that I know. But during that 100,000, I'm telling you, I saw persons that I'd never seen before. 
So I was thinking, some, and I'm talking about kids, right? 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, right? So I was thinking to myself, where were these children before? You know, were parents hiding their kids, right? And when, you know, we had that disallowance, which I don't blame them, it came out, right? So if that isn't, um, if you can look at something like that, I would say we definitely have a long way to go because um, I, I would say people are hiding their children, right? There's still a stigma. There's still some shame that's being, right? Some people think about persons with disability. There's still some sort of shame into it, right? So, yeah, we still have a long way to go. But, you know, um, I, want, I just want to say something. So in Guyana, there's a lot of um, NGOs that are foreign that come, in, um, come into the country. And, uh, for example, there's one called um, IFES, right? And they have something called um, Utilize Program where they teach um, young kids, particularly those um, like myself, with personal disabilities, the skills and tools needed to, you know, become better advocates, right, in your community. And so a lot of times they would host these events and we would go up there in our soapbox and we would talk about some of the issues that we face, right? And I remember they, 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 they had an event at, a, um, at the Archer Song Center where they invited um, persons with disabilities. And I remember once I finished uh, my presentation and I went home, I got a call from one of my friends and she said, man, I saw you and Fiona. Fiona is another person with a disability. And you guys sounded so, right, so, um, you guys sounded so intelligent. Right? And, and I looked at you guys and I, and I, and I was bursting with admiration, right? So I think that comes to what I was saying. Even something as small as that, right? Maybe, you know, those parents of those kids need to come and see that you know, if, if, these, if their children were given the opportunities that we, that, that we have, you know, um, they can just, um, you know, just give your kids the opportunity that we have so they, you know, you know, they can look. And um, you know what I'm trying to say? Sorry, I, my thoughts are a bit jumbled. But what I'm just trying to say is that um, if they see us in this positive light, then you know maybe we can do our best to change those you know those harmful stereotypes or those harmful way of thinking, right? So we we need that representation. Great, well said, um, and and I think everybody really got the gist of what you were meaning to say. Um, definitely, kind of encouraging family members to get their loved ones who may have disabilities involved, um, get them the assistance that they need. Um, so that we could begin to break those that stigma that surrounds uh, the issue of disabilities. Um, and I guess we're going to right away. Oh, go ahead. Nice if you don't mind, I just want to jump in briefly no, course, on this. In. And I looked at the time and I kept going back and forth, but I think no, it's, go ahead, it's jump worth in. saying. So in addition to being professor and director and all of these things, I'm super proud right now to be a fairly new mom and, you know, talk about the lens that that gives you on life and, as I'm thinking about this disability conversation, and we're saying that the onus is on the person with a disability or who is different, differently abled, because even that language we're having to change, right? Where you know uh, different uh, capabilities depending, and their families. I think it's also incumbent upon society to create the spaces where they feel safe to engage. Um, if someone is constantly being shamed ridiculed, you know, we have different cultures where, you know, you didn't pray enough. And so, you know, this is why this happened to you or whatever have you. We have to acknowledge the societal role um, for those of us who are able in a way to speak up and be a representative to create the space for those that don't necessarily. So things like a, a nursing mom, you know, um, my kid is 18 months and I nursed until 18 months. And there was a stigma around that that I didn't even realize, you know, it's usually like, oh, under one, the kid could walk and eat. Why are you doing that or whatever? And it takes others to create the, you know, the science says up to two years or all these different things, you know. So anyway, um, what I'm seeing now are like children's books or even conversations with parents. If your kid sees someone in a wheelchair, sometimes you don't want to be embarrassed if the kid starts pointing or something. And to just get down and let the kid know, oh, you know, we don't point at people, but if you're curious, we can go say hi or, you know, whatever it is and making it okay 
versus putting the shame or trying to be polite, but having an adverse impact and taking that into adulthood. So I think it's a role for all of us to be more aware to ourselves, spend time with differently abled people um, to build that awareness and then bring that into the spaces we have access to that they may not yet, but definitely should. Thank you. And well said, uh, it's, it's definitely something we need to look more at, not just regionally, but then our own social networks. And um, I'm glad we're here having this type of conversation. Um, so yeah, we can jump right in to our fourth question, which says, how can we integrate climate adaptation initiatives in rural and urban spaces to provide economic opportunities for women? Um, and we can start this question. Um, Cheyenne, you want to start this one off for us? Yes, thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, and just to just so we keep the conversation going to Gabriel talked about uh being differently abled when it comes to mobility issues, but of course there are others who are uh, like my uh I am, it, it hurts me to my core, and I'm not even disabled or differently abled in any way. Um, because one of my really good friends, her son is autistic and he's now learning to speak because he has a speech impediment and being able to communicate his wants or his needs. And if he flares up, which happens when they're small or younger, you know, the reaction from people, she says, Sean, I am so afraid to even bring him back to Trinidad because of the stigma that's attached to people who are differently abled or people who have some sort of challenge in any way. Once you're not normal, problems. So, and that, and that bothered me. I was like, why would you, why would you not even want to come home? She migrated to Canada to get better access to resources for her son. And that in itself is a problem. And so I've found there are many persons who, who, that has happened to Gabriel went to Costa Rica and saw how, how, you know, nice things were for lack of a better word. You know, the fact that he was able to access places and do things that he, he can't do in his own country. And that says that we still have a lot of work to do. But when it comes to climate resiliency um, and ensuring gender equality, you know, we have to, I am one of those people that kind of kick the door down <laughs> I did not wait for it to be opened. And so as a woman who works in a traditionally male-dominated space of waste management, and it still is, you have to understand, one, that you need allies and advocates. You need people who will champion the work that you're doing, who will call your name in rooms that you are not. And so you would continue to lead from, uh, you know, with, with the support to get to help you get to where you need to be. And understanding that the, the statistics show that women are the most affected by the effects of climate change. We are. When it comes to, then we start to think things about uh, like period poverty and, and access to sanitary and hygiene products and all of these things. You know, we have to start putting that in place so that we're not waiting, we're not, not continuing to be a reactive society, but a proactive one. There are a number of, and I'm just looking at um, Dana Lynn's comment there, you know, our own cultures um, do present problems as well. Our own cultures as it pertains to how we treat those who are different than we are, how we, and as and from one season, well, I'm not seasoned that, but I'm a little older mommy than, than Dr. V is because my last two are nine and eight. <laughs> so it is, you know, teaching them kindness, teaching them empathy, teaching them if I see, if they see someone who looks different, don't point and, and stare, but, you know, you have uh, the ability to ask a question. And the great thing is that my, my children ask tons of questions. So I say, well, mommy, somebody came to school today. Um, and they, I saw that they had like a, I mean, I keep it simple. I saw that they had something was wrong with their feet and I felt so sad, you know, and I wanted to go and say something to them. My daughter would say that. Yeah. 
So it really starts on teaching them about if you see someone who is different than you are, no matter what the differences may be, you treat them with love, kindness, and empathy. Um, but in just ensuring that we uh, continue to manage our resources to ensure that we both do the mitigation and the adaptation to ensure resiliency, to make sure that we um, look at the big picture, look at the whole entire picture. So we talked about agriculture, we talked about transportation, we talked about the built environment, um, but we also have to talk about the environmental side and waste management and conservation and how all of those things play a role in planning and ensuring that the, the negative effects on the environment are little to none. And so it, I, I often feel like we, we only look at bits and pieces of the picture, but we don't look at it as a whole. What are the services that people are gonna need access to or will lose access to in the event of a natural disaster? You know, where's all, I, I have this bad nightmare that if Trinidad gets hit with a hurricane, all the garbage from all the landfills are just going to be running down the streets. I mean, it keeps me up at night. <laughs> so what are the things that we can do to start building that, to start in, to ensure uh, that that doesn't happen? We don't have engineered sites right now, and a lot of the Caribbean islands do not. So in the event of a disaster, where does all that garbage go? Who is, you know, how do we manage that? Um, and so those are some of the types of questions uh, that we need to start asking to really get some of the solutions we're looking for. Thank you so much. Uh, the waste management part to me always seems to be the element that gets forgotten. Um, it and does. It until it's like <laughs> piled up. Um, we've definitely seen that here in the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. You know, there was piles of waste and it was nothing that people really you know, thought about a plan for um, how do you separate the waste? Where do you put it? Um, they actually had to use random like public land to be able to, to accommodate the amount of waste that that was the result of a hurricane. Um, so yeah, that's that's a big part that for the region we have not figured out. Um, and we've definitely not figured out the proper landfills. Uh, it's a huge capital investment, but uh, engaging private sector may be a good alternative to get those areas in suitable conditions. Um, but that's thing, say, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. And that's no, what I want to add is the power of education. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, because that is that is the nature of what I do every single day. Um, and how can we, and I always say it's not, I always say this in the Caribbean, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So mm -hmm. how can we change the narrative? How can we start teaching people about resiliency, about urban planning, about and how it affects um, the different communities, the youth, the women, and the, the, those that are disabled. How can we, because Gabriel touched on it when he was speaking, education is extremely important in getting us to where we need to be, but we have to understand that the way we educate is just as important. How we relate that information, how we share, what are the different mechanisms that we're using, how we're reaching, how are we reaching the blind, how are we reaching the deaf, how are we reaching uh, those that are physically incapacitated in some way. So that is also critical to uh, being able to, to become more resilient. We also have to pay attention to education. Great point. Uh, Vanessa, go ahead. Yeah, building off of that education piece ties into how I want to answer this. That community that I talked about, the rural community in Tiguav, started a sort of community composting initiative. And, you know, the kids would be involved, the adults, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, it tied into this environmental stabilization project that we had, where, um, you know, so deforestation, as you know, a lot of countries are dealing with this. Haiti, looking at the a aerial map of just the island of Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic side and the Haiti side is night and day. And that's a whole thing. But as part of this project, we were responding not only to the environment in terms of just planting more trees, but it was also looking at um, dealing with the environment, but also finding ways to incorporate economic activity based on the crops that we were using to, 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 build, to, to build the plant. 
And so not to get too technical, first we used vertiver, which is a very dense grass, if people are not familiar with, that grows really quickly. And it's made this uh, roots are able to grow two, three meters deep into the ground. So it was able to break up dirt that had become like concrete and desert, uh, like uh, more or less to then plant a line of trees and then planting cash crops that grow well under shade, you know, coffee, beans, whatever have you. And this whole mix, integrating the school children to, you know, be watering the tree, you know, all of this to produce uh, economic activity. So what they were, you know, in, in terms of being able to grow again and then sell as like one, you know, example. Other things that come to mind, there's this um, this project in a Dutch Caribbean island, St. Eustatius, where they were able to build this big energy solar park. The island now runs on like 97% of solar by day, and they've been able to significantly reduce their diesel. And it's just diesel use. In addition to being a solar park, they're able to also grow like cash crops under the solar panels, uh, things that don't need as much uh, sun. Uh, they're able to use animals for grazing. There's water collection activity. There are all types of uses that we can wrap around the environment that are solving multiple issues at once. I think it's important for us to think about these activities as green jobs and how do we incorporate the training of women and younger children um, and those, again, with different abilities to participate in this as part of nurturing the earth. I think we also need to think about um, you know, just the ongoing, you know, training and starting from like those like grassroots sort of more or less projects through, you know, local governance and just the basic job of your local government to deliver basic public services. So everything from like housing is a basic service, but then also being able to like maintain the water source is a basic service that also ties into the environment um, through national and beyond. So those are some adaptation measures that come to mind, but that can have a wraparound economic component um, from my perspective. Great, thank you so much. And as we go into our last question, um, how can we reduce climate risk faced by women, people with disabilities and other minorities who reside in climate vulnerable areas. And Mariah, you want to get us started on this one? I mean, I guess I can. Um, and I also wanted to comment on Dr. B's last um, comment and statement and say that that is very insightful um, and very lucrative, especially in the Caribbean where we have so much rich soil um, and so much sun, so much sun. The Caribbean vir virtually has some of the highest um, captures, sun capture in the world and exposure. Um, because you don't have as much high buildings. And so it would be very lucrative um, for people, for women especially, to use that as a, main, a means of economic um, benefit uh, with even like net metering systems for solar and everything else. Um, but to answer this question, um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Of course. Um, how can we reduce climate risk faced by women, people with disabilities, and other minorities? who reside in climate vulnerable areas? Yes, I, I think that um, the first thing that comes to mind is disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction and really just planning for mitigation. Um, and as um, Ms. Shan said, and not for not reacting to the problem, which is something that we see a lot in the Caribbean, um, especially with floods. For instance, Guyana is on the sea level, and we we know that we will get flooded every time rain, every time there's heavy rainfall, and still they still insist to put sandbags. Um, and uh, the main point of this conversation is that the frontline communities um, are women and children, and so they suffer a lot from the effects of those um, disasters. And so, I think really policy and planning. Um, needs to be hammered down on in the Caribbean. Um, I think that there's a lot of loose policy when it comes to disaster risk management. Um, and so policy and planning along with um, the implementation of sustainable infrastructure um, and really infrastructure that will protect frontline communities. But yeah, I don't have much else on that. No, those are very good points. Um, definitely about the loose policy. We see that, I think we see that very often throughout the region where 
policy is just a piece of paper and it's not implemented, it's not followed, it's it's just collecting dust on somebody's shelf. So uh, we definitely, yeah, definitely agree with your points made. Um, Sharon, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. And I see Doreen is eager. <laughs> so right after. Um, so it, it, I think we've already answered that in, in talking about when we all spoke about the importance of green infrastructure, when we all spoke about the importance of better agricultural practices. Um, and the last part that Dr. V was alluding to was the use of nature-based solutions, you know, and use of like the vegetable grass and the fact that the roots can be turned into economic things like mats and chairs. And, you know, I have seen some fantastic products made from vetiver grass. Huh? Um, so we, so all of those things have to work together. They can't work. Yes, she said, oh, I'm going to perfume and soaps. And I mean, the list can go on and on. So it has both the, the property of allowing us to manage our resiliency or risk. And then it also has the economic benefits. Same with plastics and waste management has the ability to be a good uh, building infrastructural product, but you can also sell and make money from it as well. So it's really an amalgamation of some of the things that we've already said, because those are the things that will also help us to reduce the risk, to be able to, you know, just ensure that the way that we construct things or Oh, and I was going to say this. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we have the East Dry River. That river is now paved. It's concrete, but it wasn't originally. And I remember doing a river mechanics class um, at the University of the West Indies. And the professor saying that was the worst decision that we could have ever made was to pave it. Now we have a lot of flooding issues. Now I am, now I can see why he would say that because the flooding in the capital city of Port of Spain is ridiculous. And so we have to, I'm like, we need to start looking at other uh, measures to help us to reduce this, you know, unclog the do, do better uh, works in terms of unclogging drains, in terms of having uh, retention ponds and all of those things that I've seen as I've traveled in the US and other parts of the world that we simply aren't doing because we are small island developing states. We do have limited resources. And so we really have to get creative with what we need to do to reduce our own risk. So I'll hand it over to Doreen as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think there are two answers to this question in terms of how we reduce our climate risk. Right. There's one, the, the physical infrastructure that I think we've talked about. So like all of these kind of innovations that are important that we kind of institute and roll out in our cities and our towns and our communities. Right. But I think there's also another one, which is a social infrastructure. Right. And social infrastructure is something that I think we ignore. But yet all of our communities before a disaster, after a disaster, during a disaster, that is actually what we're relying on. I'll give us a quick example. During Hurricane Dor Dorian, a friend of mine, her mom is a teacher in Bahamas and she couldn't get in contact with her mom. And I remember messaging Kendria after I just met Kendria and she was started going through all of these kind of networks that she has to be like, have you seen this Jamaican woman? Have you seen this woman? And I remember her like using those social networks, using those relationships she had to help give me and my friends some information of where her mom was, right? And I think it's it's so important that we think about social infrastructure and investing in it and supporting it. So when I talk about social infrastructure, I'm talking about schools, I'm talking about resident associations, I'm talking about clubs, sporting clubs, right? Those kind of networks of people that are close in it that have relationships of trust that have built up over time, right? So with those, you know, levels and, and capacities of trust, you're better able to kind of prepare for a natural disaster and recover afterwards, you know what I mean? And I think there's lots of ways that our governments can think about how to support and better enable and empower these organizations and these, whether they're formal or informal, it's really important that we recognize the value of them and that there is academic kind of studies around, like communities that have better social capital that are more closely knit, respond better to natural disasters. That's researched, right? So if that is the case, I think our churches, our clubs really need to start going through trainings of like, what do you do in an earthquake? 
What do you do in a hurricane? How do you clean water? So those type of simple kind of trainings that you can give to people who are already embedded in communities um, is essential. And I think we need to also think about the efficiency of those people responding after a natural disaster because we know that the government is going to take five and a day. International help is going to be five and a day as well. So just investing these relationships that are already there, that's already growing and developing and just giving them the tools to better respond. Such great points. Go ahead, Vanessa, jump right in. I'm jumping out of my skin. I love it. That's exactly to the point that I wanted to highlight. So one of the key classes that I teach uh, is planning for emergencies and disasters. And you have the emergency management cycle. It starts with preparedness, response, recovery, mitigation. And, you know, Doreen talked about tons and tons of academic studies. We have an, an abundance of resources that show that it's the social, local, pre-existing networks that are there before the disaster that are first activated when a disaster hits. What do I mean by that? It tends to be a lot of times like the women in the community who know, yes, I need to be evacuated, but three doors down, there's an elderly woman who's bedridden, you know, go to her as well. You know, across the street, she has five kids, go to her as well. You know, so it's understanding what those networks and dynamics are that are already existing. I mentioned the church, the local groups, you know, that uh, being aware of and knowing how to activate them when time hits, it's easier for someone to trust their local pastor or their neighbor or whatever have you than it is to trust someone flying in, you know, or, you know. And so uh, the importance of those networks and realizing that local knowledge and how valuable it is to connecting to disaster response, preparedness and response is critical in terms of minimizing the extent of lives lost particularly when we know that women and children um, and those who are differently abled are the most susceptible um, because of not having enough time or awareness that they should even leave, for example. And that ties into also um, early evacuation systems. Um, part of activating those networks, um, also thinking about the formal and structural ways, um, community alarms, you know, um, New York City is not the best example comparing to a small island developing state, but we have, you know, you'll get a text message, flash flood warning, you know, in an hour, even things now when there's like a missing kid or an adult, you know, um, who's like, who took off in a car and, you know, might have um, Alzheimer's or something to that effect. There are all of that to say, there are ways to mobilize the community at large with as much time as possible that we need to think about, especially when we know these things are coming. Something like the earthquake in Haiti did not see coming. One had not happened in over a hundred plus years, right? But we know hurricanes are coming. We know floods are coming and they're increasing in intensity. How we think of the infrastructural and built response um, uh, sort of approaches to minimizing these impacts, activating those social networks and tying in what may seem informal into formal channels has to be part of making us more resilient. Uh, thank yeah. you so much. Go ahead, Mariah. Well, Oh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to jump what Dorian and um, Dr. B said and said how cell that is so important and that social infrastructure and, and its most logical sense. Um, and uh, almost from a social science point of view, it's ethos and emotion comes before logic, um, especially in dire situations. So, yeah. So, to just add, you know, for all of the agencies of the organization, silence. For them to work together, I think oftentimes in the Caribbean, we have this silo approach, but I would do it. And then, you know, this thing, you know, we say the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, and that tends to present a problem, especially in those scenarios. So one organization thinking it's them and the others, they're thinking, no, 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 it's not me, it's you. Um, so the power of working together truly, you know, to, to support each other, you know, not underscoring anybody's role but understanding that we all have a role to play in all the aspects of society, uh, but we have to work together and not in silence. Thank you guys so much. What a very engaging and relevant conversation tonight. Um, we heard a lot of key points uh, and, and the main takeaways is definitely that we must stop working in silos and stop trying to tackle issues in silos. We must find those synergies between issues um, and we must really incorporate the human element in our urban city and rural development decision making and design. Um, when we're talking about disasters and really beefing up resiliency within our communities, um, it's definitely a need to uh, inspire others to get involved 
increase capacity so that we may be able to utilize those social networks to our greater benefit. And then also, of course, the role of education. We must value education at all levels. Uh, we must create youth and a new generation that is very empathetic, that is understanding, that is uh, accepting. And by doing that, we must really embrace education. Um, thank you all so much for your, for your contribution today. We do have a few questions in the chat. So uh, we have roughly 12 minutes for questions. So let's just dive right into the questions. Uh, one of the first questions that we have is, I think there are cultural barriers that impact how we move forward in creating safe physical spaces for children or people with disabilities. So the panelists, how can we tackle this? Gabrielle, I don't know if you're there, if you want to jump on this one first. Um, I'll repeat the question again. Sure. Um, I think there are cultural barriers that impact how we move forward in creating safe physical spaces for children or people with disabilities. How can we tackle that? Um, for us, um, um, hmm. I think um, one of the main ways that we can tackle it is through, um, like a lot of persons have said, um, is education. Right. In schools, what are we teaching our kids? Right. Um, are we helping them to understand, um, um, you know, the culture of, let's say, in Guyana, um, Afro-Guyanese and Indo-Guyanese? Because I feel like um, I think Mariah can maybe back me up on this when she speak, when I um, speak on you know, the issue, the racial issue, the racial tension that um, you know, those two parts of Guyana, you know, um, have. And I feel before we, um, in order to tackle that, we, it has to be a concerted effort um, from the government, from parents, from um, society as a well. whole to educate um, um, each other and to make sure that we have a, a better understanding. But that isn't going to um, change if our, um, our politicians right, feel that in order to, um, to gain power, they have to make sure that we, you know, we're kept um, separated and at the truth. So we, we definitely in Guyana will um, deal with, you know, our racial issues. And the only way that can be dealt with is through education. I don't know when that is going to happen, right? But um, yeah, that's the definite, the main thing is that, you know, we have to be um, be educated so we can empathize and understand each other better. And then, you know, things will become better. So I hope I was able to understand. I, I hope I was able to answer that question adequately. Yeah, you gave some feedback. Panelists, feel free to jump in on that one. Yeah, I just wanted to add in from the kind of urban planning, urban design um, perspective, right? So there are global design standards that exist that can make um, our city um, accessible for a person who has a physical disability, right? There are design standards that go to engineers, people are implementing and designing and building up houses and roads and streets and community spaces, right? Those exist. Um, in the US, those designs are very much connected to kind of the Disabilities Act, right? So that if a public space is not accessible, um, I can sue that building, right? So if I can't take my wheelchair up into this library, I can sue you, right? And of course, you don't have that yet in the Caribbean. But I think to Gabriel's point, there is a need for very immense and regional kind of coalition building. Right. Because the disabilities folks in Jamaica, I'm not sure if they're talking to the disability advocates folks in Guyana. Right. Even though we are ostensibly experiencing the very same problems. Right. So I think thinking about these issues more regionally is important because one island, one country may be a little bit further ahead. There may be policies that you can policies and strategies that you can pull and employ in your space. But I think to his point. Um, the design solutions, the infrastructure solutions are out in the world, but we need the kind of political solutions and the political power to get them to be implemented. Good. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I would only say um, to comment on Lorraine's point with it being regional. Look at things like CARICOM. Um, we make kind of like regional decisions with CARICOM about money and economics and trade. And things like this, disability inclusive, 
um, policies as it pertains to buildings and building standards get left out of your conversation. And so I think, as she said, it's very um, it's very pertinent for it to be implemented at a higher level like that, where um, all the Caribbean almost has to comply. Very good point. Um, I definitely agree. Um, we have a few more minutes to go. So I do have a waste management uh, directed question, Chan. So please get ready. Uh, the question says, we hear about interesting technologies, like Shan talked about recycling plastic to make building materials and things like to grab some weed to, be, to make building blocks. What are the obstacles to actually working on implementing these type of technologies? Thank you for the question. I saw that I was kind of mentally prepping. Um, the big one is access to finance. I think a number of organizations who want to do more, want to implement more, but they don't have the finances to be able to buy the equipment or to get things started. Another issue that comes in there is the collection of the materials. So uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, all of the plastics, so we have a, a couple of different players now. First, they were going to the eye care program, um, and then it will go to the solid waste management company, Swim Falls uh, Material Recovery Facility. Um, and now we have the Every Bottle Back uh, program, which also takes only plastic bottles. So if I, as a new business coming into this landscape, want to make plastic lumber, how am I collecting the materials? I may have to consider purchasing the materials from these organizations. And again, it was back down to do I have the finances to be able to afford it? The other thing too is the, techno the technology. Is it, we're now having conversations as a region, as a Caribbean region about technology um, and the use of technology um, in, in, in our respective islands, but in the waste space, it's still very traditional. We're not as technologically advanced as we could be. And so it is allowing that to happen, allowing the introduction of new technologies to be able to take us from where we are to where we need to be. So those are like the top three um, issues, I would say, as to why it's not implemented on a larger scale. And I'll give you a real hard, honest reason. A lot of people simply just don't want to do it because they think it might be too hard. Um, because they may be told that it won't work. They already have people doing it. What you're trying to do, they instantly tell themselves no before someone else does. And that's a real honest reason as to why people aren't doing it. They face challenges, they get the roadblocks, and then they tell themselves it's not worth it. You know? Um, so it's pushing past that, pushing past those those mental challenges and those blocks, um, then we'll be able to see um, more, of, more of that happening. Yeah. So I hope I answered that question in that video. Yes. It seems yeah, like well, you did yeah. <laughs> in the chat, but no, you, you definitely brought up a good point of the mental blocks and then just the simple will to do things, right? The will to change the way we look at waste, the way we change how we look at uh, persons with disabilities or limitations. Um, it just has to be a will. And that will more than likely has to be led by political will so that we can really see some of the changes that you guys spoke about tonight. Um, if there's anybody uh, on the call who may have a question, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. We can possibly take one, maybe two. Um, but if there is one person with a, with a question, we'll definitely take it. Um, and then I'll just circle around the panelists to give one last thought really quick. What is the big takeaway that you want people to know uh, from your either your area of study or profession or based on the conversation tonight? Uh, let's start with Mariah. Oh, sure. Um, I guess what I want to leave with is that as, most, as you can see, um, a lot of this panel is young. Um, and I think that sometimes we have a very negative, slightly pessimistic attitude towards climate change and sustainable development. 
And I'd like to say that Gen Z is taking charge. Um, we are open, we're diverse. Um, we believe in equity, we believe in change. And so um, that makes me very hopeful. So yeah, I guess that's what I want people to leave with, that we are a bit different from our old generations, no shade to the old generations, but um, we do, we are strong in our beliefs and systems. So yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, Gabriel, one last final word. Of my watching here, but I would like to I like I, I hope that if they're listening that they understand the importance of infrastructure. I think that was one of the main things that we heard, right? Infrastructure, infrastructure, accessible infrastructure, right? Because in Guyana we have a lot of initiatives for persons with disabilities. This is something I um I maybe wanted to add to, um, when I spoke um earlier, but I didn't. Right? We have a lot of um you know um, opportunities, for example. Um, you know, you're able to go to Eugene. I'm um, sorry, you're able to um, um, to um, access um, places to, um, like the goal the goal program where you know you can access um, and improve your tertiary education. Um, University of Guyana is on ground. Um, there's a, there's a variety of skills training available and all of those things. Right? There's a lot of awareness. But then you hear a lot of um, persons saying, I, I'm being taught all those skills and all this knowledge, but I feel stuck because um, I don't have any jobs. They teach us all, but yet because they're not doing, um, they're not making the major infrastructural changes, it feels like it's all for naught, right? So I think it's important to say, all right, all these are wonderful, right? But don't tap um, yourself on the shoulder you still have a long way to go, right? So make those changes in infrastructure, make infrastructure accessible. Thank you so much, Dorian. Yeah, I wanted to echo Maria's points. Um, I, I, I do think in the Caribbean, it's easy to feel kind of jaded and that, you know, this environment is never going to change. And so half of my family has migrated, I'm going to migrate too, right? And I And I think what I want to leave with is that change in our physical environment is possible, right? There are all of these amazing stories from across the world, from, you know, global South countries of communities coming together and doing radical acts to really transform their built environment. There's so many, like, really inspiring examples, not just in terms of making the space more accessible for people with disabilities or caregivers and women and children, but also making the environment healthier. You know, communities who have advocated to remove a landfill or some, you know, toxic polluting um, source from their communities, right? So I, I, I want, as Mariah said, for younger generations, for the, the folks who, you know, are frustrated and realize that there, there is better to be had in our Caribbean cities and towns um, to look broadly, look widely for those sources of inspiration and understand that if the government is not doing it, there are means and ways. I think this, this conference is a wonderful example of coalition building of people coming together to you know, work towards a shared vision. And I think that's always possible. And it's important to say that it's possible. Great points. Uh, Sean, go ahead. Two things. One, I want to reiterate the importance of education. I think no matter what we try to do, if we leave it out, we won't really get to where we want to be. And as Mariah and Dory talk about youth are taking on the on the lead thing, I will not have more no, but are taking the youth. <laughs> right? Um, you know, really to understand the power that you guys have. And I'm speaking to you because you're younger than I am, I was. And uh understanding that you guys are the next ones that will do the things that my generation and the generations before me have not been able to. So when we talk about education, we're not just talking about the presentation of information, but we're talking about motivating people to action. Any education effort, that should be its main purpose, motivating people to action. Because as I say, it's not always about doing things better, but sometimes, we simply need to do better things. Thank you so much. Uh, Dorian, I saw your hands up. You're cheating. <laughs> no, no, I was applauding. 
Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Dr. Vanessa Dean, take us out with your last your last thought. Yes, yes. In closing, you know, one of the things that I love most about being an urban planner is that every planning process essentially has to start with the vision, a vision of where the community would like to be. And then you sort of work not just having this pie in the sky vision, but how do you work from where you're trying to get to? putting in the goals and objectives in place as to how you're going to get there. Um, And another thing that reminds me of this is something that prior to being in academia, I was a consultant. And uh, when I was just starting my firm, someone gave me this mantra of, if I can see it in my mind, then I can hold it in my hand. And I say that to say that the world we desire is possible to the extent that we will see it or won't see it in our lifetime. Ideally, we will. But even if we don't, Everything that we do as part of our contribution um, is for us and those to come in the same way that those that preceded us, uh, we're living and manifesting their visions that they may not necessarily have been able to see. This is a conference led by women speaking on a very globally charged, locally, nationally charged issue. And there was a world where women couldn't even speak in public, certainly not after having had children. And so sometimes as hard as it is to think that things can be better or different, our part and our collective efforts and finding community and like-minded individuals who are engaged to the extent that you're able to commit to engage is important to keep that momentum, to keep that pressure that'll go about changing the political will and that reality that we want to see and be in our hands. And so that's what I'd leave us with. And I thank you all for this time and opportunity to engage and looking forward to seeing what we go on to do beyond um, having had these conversations, but sort of cultivated the enthusiasm and initiative to want to do more in our respective communities. Listen, if you are not inspired to uh, (laughs) tackle the world after this, then I have no, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Uh, Tonight has been very engaging. Um, some real great nuggets and and really real great points that make us also just self-check with ourselves to make sure that we are, you know, being inclusive within our own practices. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to our ASL interpreters uh, for helping us share the message across all channels. And now uh, I'm happy to hand over to Ayana. Thank you all for attending the panelists tonight. It was a great time having you. Thank you. I just want to echo what Kenjia said. Thank you to, to you, Kenjia, for moderating and to all of the panelists. You all highlighted some amazing points as we move towards more inclusive and resilient planning processes. Some things that stood out to me were the importance of participatory decision making frameworks and also just the idea that the built environment isn't neutral. Um, so thank you all so much. Mm-hmm. And as most of you would know, tomorrow is actually Earth Day. So we're very excited about the agenda tomorrow. And given that this year for CW4CJ, we have been intentional about focusing on solutions. We have added to our program two practical workshops, one on data and the other one on photojournalism. Again, this is all about supporting and enhancing our advocacy work as we seek to improve both gender and climate justice within the region. So so if you're registered for the conference, you would have had the opportunity to select the workshop that you are most interested in there being held concurrently. So please join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. using the same link that you've been using for the past few days. Uh, So we start with the workshops and then we get into the session around establishing a collective advocacy agenda. We don't want CW4CJ to just be about dialogue. We know that that is important, but we want to be able to shift from dialogue into action. So, you know, Um, One of our panelists mentioned coalition building. You know, we we brought you together 
we've come together to discuss the issues and we, now we want to identify concrete actions that we can take as a community to improve the status of climate and gender justice in the Caribbean. So we'll be having a discussion, a presentation on some of the proposals. We want to hear from you um, because there are resources out there. So we want to be able to access these resources and make a difference, have an impact in our communities, whether it's at the national, the local, national or international level. And then we will wrap up um, CW4CJ, the formal part of it. But we also have an opportunity on Sunday to reflect on the past four days. So please join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. And I look forward to engaging with you for our eight day celebration. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for showing up. And do have a good night.